James Burt. In 1975, James Burt published Surgery of Love, in which he wrote, women are structurally inadequate for intercourse. This is a pathological condition amenable to surgery. The surgery in question often included removing the hood of a patient's clitoris, repositioning the vagina, moving the urethra, and altering the walls between the rectum and vagina. Burt performed this surgery on hundreds of women without their knowledge or consent. Cheryl Dillon went to Burt when she had a bladder problem. He talked her into having a hysterectomy, however, Burt intended to do much more. He performed a nine-hour operation, relocating Dylan's vagina and removing her clitoral hood. She woke up in agonizing pain, and she was barely conscious for the five days following the procedure. The operation made ordinary activities impossible. She could no longer sit down, wear pants, or have sex without excruciating pain. Janet Phillips also visited Bert for a hysterectomy. During her surgery, Bert cut the nerves to her bladder, which left her unable to sense when it was full, requiring her to go to the bathroom every two hours. Phillips developed bladder and urinary infections, and the friction of her clothes against her genital area left her in constant pain. She went to another gynecologist, Bradley Busacco, for relief. Busacco was horrified when he examined Phillips's genitals. Her reproductive organs were so maimed, torn, and distorted that they no longer resembled normal human anatomy. Busacco filed a complaint with the state medical board against Burt. Burt surrendered his medical license in 1988, and Ohio state officials forced him to sign a statement declaring he never would seek a license to practice in any other state. Christopher Dunch Christopher Dunch worked as a surgeon for nearly two decades. During that time, he earned the scorn of his colleagues, who called him the worst surgeon I've ever seen and a sociopath who was a clear and present danger to patients. Dunch performed a spinal fusion on one of his childhood friends, Jerry Summers. During the surgery, he sliced into one of the arteries running down Summers' spine, which caused massive bleeding. When Summers woke up, he could not move his arms or legs. Instead of ordering scans to find out what was wrong, Dunch moved on to other patients a delay that likely cost Summers the use of his arms and legs. Dunch's surgical career finally came to a halt after his operation on Jeffrey Glidewell. During the surgery, Dunch performed so poorly that the rest of the operating team had to physically restrain him to stop him from continuing. Glidewell spent the next two days lying unattended in the intensive care unit while Dunch made excuses to the family. Clydewell's family demanded another surgeon, Randall Kirby. Kirby was appalled with Dunch's work. Not only had Dunch cut into Clydewell's vertebral artery, but he had also cut into Clydewell's throat in the wrong area, and saliva and pus were coming out of the wound. An MRI found that Dunch had left a sponge festering in Clydewell's throat. Kirby reported Dunch to the Texas Medical Board, which launched an investigation, discovering his history of botching procedures. Dunch's medical license was revoked in 2013. He was found guilty of intentionally injuring his patients, and he was sentenced to life in prison in 2017. Farid Fata Michigan doctor Farid Fata diagnosed Maggie Dorsey with multiple myeloma, and he recommended that she undergo intense chemotherapy. The treatment left her a shadow of her former self. She has chronic pain, weakness, and tremors. She can no longer cook, clean, write, or comb her daughter's hair. Some days, she cannot even stand Dorsey later learned that she'd never had multiple myeloma. She was just one of many patients that Fata falsely diagnosed to make money off of chemotherapy treatments. Patty Hester, another of Fata's patients, was diagnosed with myelodysplastic syndrome, a precursor to leukemia, after Fata falsified her bone marrow test results. The treatments left her with chronic hair loss and gum tissue problems. One of the doctors who worked for Fata's cancer center reported him to the U.S. Department of Justice, and Fata was arrested. During Fata's trial, the court discovered that he had also overtreated terminal cancer patients rather than letting them die peacefully. One of his patients was given 195 chemotherapy treatments, 177 of which were unnecessary. The treatments left the patient in poor health. She has bladder and bowel issues and stage 3 chronic kidney disease. 
The U.S. Attorney's Office had initially identified 553 victims but noted there could be more, given that FATA's practice treated 17,000 patients through seven locations. FATA pleaded guilty in 2014 to poisoning hundreds of patients intentionally through unnecessary treatment, and he was sentenced to 45 years in prison. Cram Reeve Cram Reeve received 35 complaints over a 15-year period from other doctors, nurses, and patients, and in 1997, he was ordered by the New South Wales Medical Board to cease practicing medicine. However, in 2001, he took a job as a specialist obstetrician and gynecologist. Carolyn DeWagener scheduled an operation with Reeve in 2002 to have a small patch of precancerous skin removed from her labia. Before the surgery began, he leaned down and whispered to her, I'm going to take your clitoris, too. DeWagener, who was going under due to the anesthesia, could do nothing to stop him. During the surgery, he cut away all of her external genitalia. A nurse asked him why he was removing so much, and he replied, her husband's dead so it doesn't matter. The operation left DeWagener with impaired urinary function. Marilyn Hawkins also visited Reeve in 2002, complaining of a slight bladder problem. Reeve told her that she required a major gynecological operation. Hawkins was horrified with the surgery's results, he stitched me up like an old blanket, she said. I was in such agony after the operation that I could hardly sit down for about a month. He also stitched up my vagina so tight that I couldn't have sex. After the surgery, she found it more difficult to control her bladder, and she suffered a breakdown. Reeve was accused of sexual harassment and botching procedures on hundreds of women. He was struck off the medical register, and he served 11 months in prison. Aria Sabat Neurosurgeon Aria Sabat originally practiced in California but ended up facing more than two dozen medical malpractice suits. Sabat moved to Michigan in 2011 and took a job running the Michigan Brain and Spine Physicians Group. Tanaka Scott went to the group in 2012 for treatment for his bad back. Sabat recommended a spinal fusion, and Scott scheduled the surgery. The operation left Scott with tingling in his toes, the back of his right leg, and his buttocks. He told Sabat that it felt like my blood is boiling in my legs. Scott went to another doctor, who discovered that the fusion had not been performed. Investigators found that Sabat had a financial stake in a company that made spinal devices. Sabat frequently recommended that patients undergo a spinal fusion, and he failed to insert the device, saving himself quite a bit of money. Sabat billed millions in fraudulent claims. Sabat had hundreds of victims, many of whom were left with constant pain. He pleaded guilty, and in January 2017, he was sentenced to 19 years and 7 months in prison. Jacobus Van Nierop Locals were initially delighted when Jacobus Van Nierop moved to their small town. However, the horror stories soon began. Patients claimed that Van Nierop had frequently performed unnecessary procedures, which left them in agony. In 2012, Sylvian Bolestiaks arrived at Van Nierop's dental office, and, without warning, the dentist pulled eight of her healthy teeth out and immediately fixed dentures on her raw gums. She gushed blood for hours, and Van Nierop refused to relieve her pain, Bolestiaks and more than 100 people filed complaints against Van Nierop accusing him of removing multiple healthy teeth, leaving pieces of drills in their gums and teeth, causing abscesses, and creating misshapen mouths. Van Nierop fled to Canada in 2014, but he was eventually extradited back to France. The court heard Van Nierop's patient stories of how the dentist had drugged them and mutilated their mouths as they slept in his chair. The judges convicted Van Nierop of 85 counts of assault, including 45 counts of mutilation, and of 61 counts of fraud. Van Nierop was banned from practicing dentistry and fined 10,500 euros. Ian Patterson Cheryl Iami first met Ian Patterson in 2003, when she was having lumps removed from her right breast. Patterson operated on her, and he told her that she appeared to be developing cancer. Iami scheduled another surgery. When she woke up, she discovered Patterson had operated on both of her breasts. Patterson told her that she had a lump in her left breast, too. 
Ayami was initially grateful for Patterson's work, however, she was horrified with the results of the surgery. The operation left a large dent in her side. She had reconstructive surgery, but she was not satisfied with the results. Ayami later found out that her second surgery from Patterson was unnecessary, the lumps in her breasts were scar tissue left behind from his botched procedures. Patterson's colleagues began to worry about the surgeon when they noticed he was not removing enough breast tissue during lumpectomies and mastectomies, increasing the risk of cancer recurring. Patterson claimed that he had developed his own version of the operation, a cleavage-saving mastectomy. Patterson's employers launched an investigation against him, and they discovered Patterson's history of performing unnecessary surgeries. Patterson was arrested. A Nottingham Crown Court jury found him guilty in 2017, and he was ultimately sentenced to 20 years in prison. Hundreds of civil claims were filed by his victims, and his insurance had to pay out tens of millions of dollars. Spiros Panos New York orthopedic surgeon Spiros Panos wanted to make as much money as possible. He routinely saw at least 60 patients in a single office day and sometimes saw more than 90. Panos also performed as many as 20 or more surgical procedures in a single day, and he often failed to complete his operations. Panos performed several surgeries on both of Pam Bisashia's Achilles tendons, however, unbeknownst to Bisashia, he did not complete the procedures. The incomplete surgeries left Bisashia in constant pain, and she is no longer able to walk because each step feels like walking on hot coals. She fears she will end up bedridden. Bisashia and hundreds of Panos's other patients filed lawsuits against the surgeon, accusing him of botching surgeries, performing unnecessary operations on healthy patients, and prolonging their ailments. Panos pleaded guilty. He was sentenced to four and a half years in federal prison in 2014, and he was ordered to surrender his medical licenses. Panos's patients settled their lawsuit against him for $45 million. Michael Rosson Florida doctor Michael Rosen specialized in Mohs micrographic surgery, which is a technique that eradicates skin cancer by removing multiple layers of skin. Rosen developed a scam in which he falsely diagnosed skin cancer, surgically removed skin from his patients, and then billed their insurance for the procedures. Rosen repeatedly abused his patients, forcing many of them to undergo multiple operations. Thirteen of his patients underwent surgery at least 20 times each, and one patient underwent 122 procedures over 20 years. None of them ever questioned how every biopsy they took could be positive. His staff, however, became suspicious when they realized that Rosin found skin cancer in more than 99% of his patients' skin samples. One of his employees made one slide with a styrofoam sample and another with a piece of chewed bubble gum on it, Rosin diagnosed both as cancerous. His employees reported him. Rosin was found guilty on 70 counts of healthcare fraud in 2006. He was ordered to pay $7.2 million in fines and restitution, and he was sentenced to 22 years in prison. Glenn Tucker Glenn Tucker was working as a plastic surgeon in Milwaukee in 1978 when Jan Lehman was brought into the ER with a broken nose. Tucker told Lehman that she needed immediate surgery. Without waiting for the swelling to go down, which was standard procedure, he gave her pain medication and prepped her for the operation. Lehman woke up in agony. Lehman visited Tucker every week for two months, and she underwent another surgery. As time passed, she found it more and more difficult to breathe. While she was waiting for Tucker in an exam room, she blew her nose, and a large amount of neon yellow pus came out. Tucker walked into the room and she told him something was not right. Tucker looked calmly at her, smiled, and said, the tissue is perfectly clear, January. You just don't want to get better. Lehman realized that something was wrong with Tucker. She left the room, and she made an appointment with another doctor. He examined her, and he found the gauze Tucker had left in her nose months before. It was yellow and festering with infection. Lehman spent weeks fighting the infections and abscesses in her sinuses. Tucker's treatments had left her nose cartilage so mangled that one side of her nose would eventually collapse, 
and Lehman would awaken with cartilage protruding from her skin. More than a dozen patients filed malpractice suits against Tucker. One man, who was suffering from spasms in his arm, saw Tucker for an operation. The surgery went so bad that the man lost the use of his arm, and it had to be amputated above the elbow. Another patient visited Tucker for breast augmentation in 1979. Her breasts became infected, leading to two more unsuccessful surgeries. One time, Tucker jabbed an 18-centimeter in, needle into her breast without anesthetic, and he ripped part of an implant out of an incision without any pain medication. One of the patient's breasts ended up square-shaped, and both were terribly scarred. In 1982, as the malpractice suits piled up, Tucker disappeared during a fishing trip, and a funeral was held a few days later. A few years later, a journalist doing a report on hospital infections discovered that Tucker was still alive. More than two decades after that, he shot his wife, their cat, and himself. Michael Swango Medical doctors who commit murder in their professional practices often go undetected for long periods of time. Mainly, this occurs because they are tending to sick people who already have a high likelihood of dying. Such was the case with Michael Swango. After a stint in the United States Marine Corps, Swango eventually went to the Southern Illinois University School of Medicine. From there, he became a surgical intern at Ohio State, where his murders apparently began in the early to mid-1980s. His co-workers began to notice the high frequency with which his patients were dying. But in a medical environment, accusations of murdering patients are strikingly hard to prove. Although Swango was investigated and cleared, he was not permitted to become a surgical resident at Ohio State. Instead, he went to work for an ambulance service as an emergency medical technician. His co-workers realized that they always fell violently ill when Swango brought them food or coffee. He was arrested for poisoning them with arsenic and other substances and was eventually sentenced to five years in prison. After his release, he fell in love with a nurse, Kristen Kinney. But even love couldn't suppress his violent tendencies. For no apparent reason, Kinney became severely ill on many occasions. In truth, Michael Swango had poisoned his own girlfriend, and she later committed suicide. Using forged credentials, Swango had resumed working at another medical institution, where his patients mysteriously died once again. Through a combination of circumstances, he was found out and the subsequent outcry forced Swango to run from the FBI to Zimbabwe. But his crimes inevitably caught up with him, and he was sentenced to life in prison. Although the exact body count is unknown, Swango had the opportunity to poison many people. Using arsenic as his main tool of murder, he remained completely under the radar for years. Swango is suspected of killing up to 60 individuals. John Christie John Christie was an English serial killer who murdered under the guise of patient care, although his medical practice was entirely illegal. He offered abortion services to prostitutes. Abortion was illegal in England during the span of his killings between 1943 and 1953. With the aid of his wife, Ethel, John Christie would render his victims unconscious with a combination of gases intended to be anesthesia for surgery. Then he would strangle his victims to death. Christie is believed to have killed six to eight people this way, with some counts ranging as high as ten. Like serial killer John Wayne Gacy Jr., Christie buried his victims beneath the floorboards and in the crawl space of his flat. The police uncovered most of the bodies there. John Christie was a monster who even turned on his wife and murdered her. During an abortion procedure, he also killed the unborn child of his next-door neighbors, Timothy and Beryl Evans, as well as Beryl. Later, Christie murdered the Evans other child, Geraldine. Timothy Evans took the fall, and John Christie testified against him for murder. Evans was hanged. But in a beautiful twist of fate, John Christie was eventually convicted for his murderous rampage and hanged on July 15, 1953. John Bakken Adams On October 1, 1956, Police confronted long-standing Dr. John Bakken Adams with considerable evidence that he was a serial killer who had taken over 100 lives. His trial for murder took place in 1957. Adams was strategically, 
politically, and economically savvy. He was able to befriend the local mayor and other notable figures as well as borrow from patients to invest in property and cars. This provided passive income while he worked and allowed him to continue killing beneath the facade of a distinguished gentleman. Adams's motive for murder was simple, greed. He killed his patients in various ways. Before doing so, he often convinced them to give up a large part of their income. For example, prior to killing one woman's husband, Adams tried to persuade the wife to give him a portion of her inheritance for his attempts to save her husband. As he made house calls, Adams was also invited into patients' homes to care for them. There, he would maliciously murder them. Adams was a professional con man who blurred the lines of medical practice, murder, and euthanasia. O.H., and that trial in 1957 where he was facing execution by hanging? He was found not guilty. Though he was barred from medical practice due to the scandal and stripped of his license, Adams died a free man in 1983. Thomas Neal Cream Thomas Neal Cream was the epitome of the sociopathic criminal. He was a thief, arsonist, burglar, practitioner of illegal abortions, and murderer. He also happened to be a physician. Many have speculated that Cream was responsible for the Jack the Ripper murders because Cream killed around the same time. However, he was believed to be in prison when many of the Ripper murders occurred. Cream only killed women. He commonly used poison, which was quite different than the brutal, gory nature of the Ripper murders. Although Cream took intermittent breaks between murders, he was convicted after the body of a former patient was exhumed for analysis. Strychnine poisoning was found. However, this didn't stop him. Even though he received a life sentence, he was released on good behavior and became free to murder again. Cream was eventually hanged for his crimes. Kermit Gosnell Kermit Gosnell is another unorthodox case. Unlike the others listed so far, he was a licensed, legal abortion doctor. Some of Gosnell's murders were a legal distinction when it came to abortion, he performed experimental abortions and illegal, late-term abortions. The FBI and the Philadelphia police raided Gosnell's practice and described the conditions as filthy, vile, and disgusting. Among other crimes, Gosnell was eventually convicted of murdering three babies who were born alive during attempted abortions. Stephen Massif Employed by abortion doctor Kermit Gosnell, whom we just discussed, Stephen Massif was equally depraved and assisted in Gosnell's murderous rampage. In fact, Massif did much of the deranged doctor's dirty work. Massif also killed babies born alive during attempted abortions. He received a reduced sentence for his honesty during his testimony. According to his statements, he witnessed over 100 babies having their necks snapped. They were basically beheaded before his eyes. But make no mistake. Although Massif was only sentenced to 6 to 12 years in prison for his monstrous crimes, he was every bit as guilty of committing some of the murders in Gosnell's abortion clinic from hell. Jack Kevorkian Some hailed him as a philanthropist, a kind and caring man who aided in the euthanasia of people experiencing tremendous suffering that is nearly impossible to comprehend for those of us who haven't been there. Others saw Kevorkian, aka Dr. Death, as a terrifying monster, dedicated to seeking out the weak and suffering to satisfy his murderous desires. Kevorkian battled the legal system over the gray areas and the euthanasia laws of the United States at the time. But he never stopped his practice of killing patients whom he felt had suffered too much for too long. After a lengthy career which included his advocacy for assisted suicide, Kevorkian eventually engaged in his first one on June 4, 1990, with the death of Janet Atkins. The assisted suicide of Atkins catapulted Kevorkian to the national stage, where he went on to practice what some would call homicide and others would term medicine. This sparked an international debate. In 1993, the Netherlands adopted guidelines to allow doctors to conduct assisted suicides under some circumstances without fear of prosecution, although euthanasia was still deemed to be illegal at that time. Meanwhile, the United States stood chiefly against it. Kevorkian was soon arrested for his practices. However, 
the authorities were unable to convict him of murder due to the legal gray area pertaining to assisted suicide. Atkins and the others had specifically written that they had made their own choices to end their lives rather than suffer their horrible afflictions. But Kevorkian's days as a free man were numbered after a spree of very public assisted suicides. He actually videotaped and showed the world one of his killings on 60 Minutes in 1998. This is what did him in, and Kevorkian was charged with second-degree murder. Ultimately, he was convicted and sentenced to 10 to 25 years in prison. Harold Shipman Harold Shipman, a seemingly gentle British doctor, often made house calls. In this way, he was able to perpetuate a murder spree that resulted in over 200 deaths, one of the highest body counts in serial killer history. As compared to those of other physicians, Shipman's patients died at an alarmingly high rate. But people generally thought nothing of it that perhaps the doctor just had a run of bad luck or tended to the worst cases with the best of intentions. In his early years of outright killing, Shipman was investigated by the police. But their probe turned up no wrongdoing, and he was allowed to continue his deviant practices. Shipman used diamorphine, an insanely strong painkiller, to murder people. He would administer the drug intravenously and kill the patient with an overdose. He was a gentle sadist who preferred to silently kill his patients rather than delve into blood and guts. In all, Shipman claimed at least 215 lives before being convicted of 15 counts of murder. But perhaps the most terrifying aspect of Shipman's personality was that he seemed to derive pleasure from having the power to take the lives of weaker, vulnerable people. Simply put, he enjoyed killing. Donald Harvey Donald Harvey appeared to be a caring, sweet nurse's aide who worked in several different hospitals. But beneath his compassionate veneer lurked a terrifying monster with an active hatred for his patients. Harvey had many methods of killing his victims. He would force catheters too far inside them, suffocate them with pillows, poison them with cyanide, and more. Nicknamed the Angel of Death, Harvey had an incredible appetite for murder and took life whenever he pleased, sometimes killing victims on back-to-back -back days. His spree spanned decades before he was brought to justice. In a lengthy confession, he admitted to committing 87 homicides. However, more is suspected because killers often hold back on revealing the true amount of devastation they have caused. Although Harvey received multiple life sentences, they were cut short when he was fatally beaten in prison by a fellow inmate. Joseph Minchel Joseph Minchel, also dubbed the Angel of Death, was perhaps the darkest and most depraved human being to ever live. As a Nazi doctor, he was the dark face behind the twisted experiments, murders, and other horrific acts carried out behind the walls of the Auschwitz concentration camp. Menchel was particularly fond of torturing Jewish children. For his victims, he actually preferred to lengthen the time of torture until death. In fact, Menchel took great pride in the pain he inflicted on those helpless souls behind the walls of the prison camp. His name became synonymous with the final solution of Hitler's terrifying Nazi empire with its crusade against the Jews of Europe. Menchel enjoyed hand-selecting the victims who would be taken to the gas chambers. His experiments included attempts to render Jewish people sterile and boost fertility for the German race. He knew no limits, castrating his victims, freezing them to death in chambers, and more. Menchel was also particularly fond of dissecting children, especially young twins. He was one of the few Nazis who escaped the Allied invasion, when most of the other Nazis killed themselves with cyanide capsules rather than face trial for war crimes. Menchel made his escape to South America, where he lived until his death in 1979. Here ends this video. Not all doctors are bad, there are many that we should trust. Thank you for watching.